everybody. I hope you are all good to eat this evening. Mike Dixon has a cake plate with no cake. I was giving an order. Oh, okay. So, all right, good deal. That's a diet cake, right? So, all right. Hey, everybody. I'm glad you're here. And let's begin tonight with a word of prayer of about, of course, our setting, our time in this Bible study but also the other areas and activities that are happening around uh, the facilities here at First Baptist Church tonight. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful to be here in your house, Lord. We're thankful for our choir, our worship team, Lord, as they're rehearsing and, and getting uh, Father Field tonight with time of Bible study, prayer, and worship rehearsal. Father, for our student ministry as they're engaged, Lord, in what Brother Mark is sharing with them from First and Second Peter. Father, for Miss Megan and those volunteers with our children tonight as they're, Father, uh, talking about missions and talking about Jesus and sharing in an outdoor event tonight. Father, for all the areas, Lord, of ministry tonight, we just pray your hand of blessing upon them. Father, we thank you and give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, well, let me ask you to turn back for, to a very familiar passage that we looked at last week. Remember, may, you might remember last week I said, hey, just you know, thumbnail this because we're going to be here for a couple of weeks. But in, a, in, in Philippians chapter 4 uh, is really where I wanted us to, to kind of just focus and put some thoughts into in to Philippians 4, 6 through 8, and I'm just kind of breaking this down. And across the top of your prayer list, it, as I've put Philippians 4, 6, which we looked at last week, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, tonight, I want us to go one more verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, or some translations translated understanding, very close, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So last week we looked at having the peace of mind, P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace of mind, not peace of mind like, you know, I'm going to give you a peace of my mind. And, and so we were looking at how the setting of which Paul was found himself in as a prisoner giving, uh, going to give testimony uh, to Caesar, Nero, eventually, and was brought up on charges for subversion to the Roman Empire by preaching that there is another God and not Caesar. And by teaching uh, the Christian faith, which says, you know, that there, there's no Lord uh, but the Lord. And whereas the Romans wanted all authority, there was no God, no Lord but Caesar. And so that's what had, quote unquote, landed Paul in some difficulty and some trouble. But we're reminded that in the call of Paul, as we find in Acts chapter 9, that Jesus told him on that Damascus Road experience that you will be my witness and you will give uh, testimony of, more, of me before kings, before our kingdoms, and before authorities. And so all of this is coming to fruition from what Jesus told Paul that he would do at his conversion and at his call. So... The mind is, can be free from care and be ready for prayer. You see, in, in, in verse 6, it's telling us you've got to free your mind and have this peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, I'm just going to ask for honesty. And, 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 you know, yes, and, you know, I'm just going to give you fair warning. This is being video recorded, but the only people that see that is me. They, they really see me. They don't see you, so they might hear you. But it'll be uploaded tomorrow. But do you have experiences or things on your mind that, you know, when you're like, your body's tired, you know, you're, you know, now this time has changed and you're ready to go to bed at 6 at 15, 
you know, and then you think, man, I'm just ready to go to bed, you know, I'm just ready to go to bed, it's time to go to bed, it's time to go to bed, you know, it's just like, I'm going to get my shower, and I'm going to go to bed, and then you look around, and you realize, okay, but it's 635, okay, but, but at any rate, so, but then you go to bed, and then this thing, or things, plural, all up in your mind, y'all do that, yeah, And then I start sending emails or whatever in the night, and people say, you know, a crazy thing happened. I got an email from you posted at 2 10 a.m. <laughs> I'm like, that's not so crazy. That's not so crazy. Don't look at the time stamp on an email. Just read the email. Because, and then I feel guilty. Do you ever feel guilty? Because I'm like, why was I so stressed over that? Why did I let that get a grip on me like that. Why did I give in to that? Why did I give over to that? Well, Philippians 4, 6 says, hey, be anxious for nothing. Anxious anxiety, right? The two are coupled. Why are you so anxious and why is there such anxiety filling our lives? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And so it's the freeing of our mind to have a peace of mind. And once we're following that, then we can come to God in faith and expect those answers. In James chapter 1, verse 8, it says we're no longer unstable or double-minded. And so the power of prayer, we know, is an unlimited power. God was speaking to Jeremiah in a very difficult, difficult time. It was the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon in 586 B.C. And he was saying unto Jeremiah, and Jeremiah as recorded in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things of which you do not know. And so as the people of the Babylonian Empire were basically ramming the front gate of Jerusalem and it's laid siege to Jerusalem and everybody knew how this was going to end and it was not going to end well. God was telling them, I'm not done yet. Yes, it's horrific. Yes, it's bad. And yes, Jerusalem's going to fall, but I'm still not finished with my people yet. So call unto me and I will answer you, and I will show you things that you do not know. The power of prayer is unlimited. There's the prayer of faith that brings everything we need within our reach. I wanted to read this to you. Raymond Edmond is quoted as saying or writing this. Faith makes the uplook good, the outlook bright, the inlook favorable, and the future glorious. That's what faith does. So even in a tumultuous time of Jeremiah's day, when it seemed to be as bad as it could get, God was reminding Jeremiah, I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. At this terrible time is going to give way, and I'm not finished yet. So I want to share with you three things about the power of prayer. First, the prayer, power of prayer is indeed unlimited, but it also provides for difficult days. In chapter 4, verse 6, it says, In everything by prayer and supplication. Prayer is God's remedy for what is perplexing in our lives. And, and I think it's hard for us to remember because sometimes we think, well, it's just this. I mean, it's not something that we really want to petition or bother God about. There's nothing that's a bother for God. There is nothing that God seems is too small. We talked about this last week. If you, you care about it because the people you love care about it, right? Remember that last week? Anybody? Anybody can remember? All right. Good. So if somebody you love is concerned about something and bothered about something, you're bothered by it. Now, in actually, actuality, it may not really bother you, but because they're bothered about it, it bothers you. The relationship is what bothers it. If they're in, they're torn up about it, it tears you up. It concerns you. 
And so that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father. Because there's nothing that is too small for God's care, for God to care about, nor is there anything too big or large for God that he can't handle. So there's nothing too small that God doesn't care about, and there's nothing too big that God can't handle. So he cares about what we care about. And so as we look at that, prayer has rescued so many people. And they prayed and some cra- some, just some God things began to happen. I almost said crazy things, but it was crazy to the world. David prayed in Psalm 34, and the Lord saved him from his troubles. Daniel prayed and survived the den of lions in Daniel 6. Jonah prayed and was delivered from the whale's stomach in Jonah 2. Peter prayed while he was in jail, and he was freed by an angel in Acts chapter 12. Paul and Silas prayed in prison, and they were rescued by an earthquake in Acts chapter 16. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm a jailer, and I'm a Roman jailer in Rome, and I've got Paul and I've got Peter in jail, and these cats are always praying, it's never a dull day at work. Because in Acts 12, they were praying, and an angel just walked in, loosed the shackles, opened the doors, and they went home. And the jailer was there. Like, he was inquiring, like, hey, what? You know, he's like, man, these cats, you can't keep these Christians in jail. I don't know what to do. God just does stuff. And then there's an earthquake with Paul and Silas. You know, and there's probably job postings all the time. Needed, jailer, Roman prisoner. We can't keep these guys in jail. We need somebody that can take care of this. But you can't. Because these people were praying and God was answering. God provides for us in difficult days. Now, is every time God may send an angel to loose the chains, every time God may send an earthquake, every time God may deliver from the lion's den, I don't know, but I know that we have a biblical pattern from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that God hears prayer and God provides his presence through tough times. Every time. He's always there with his presence. Secondly, God provides peace in troubled times. Notice verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding or comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds. There are three dimensions of biblical peace. There's the peace of God that comes through faith in in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. But then there's the peace of God that comes through the power of prayer. That when you and I are praying, there is a peace that can sweep over us. We've been looking and, and, and walking through this Crisis 101 uh, series that just recently ended in our growth groups. And while we were doing, we know that when we're in a crisis, we're in despair. And when, when these things happen to us, it's just like a floodgate of emotion and panic and crying out and all of the things that just turned our world inside out and upside down. And then we can settle in. I'm like, okay, now my face got to go to work. Okay, I've gotten, uh, I've gotten the shock value of what the situation is, but now it's time to put and allow my faith to actually work. And so then that peace of God comes through the power of prayer. That God gives peace in a difficult situation. God gives peace of his presence when everything seems to be turned upside down. And then there's peace on earth that will come when Christ returns to reign. So prayer brings a personal peace now to we who trust in Christ. And then there's coming a day when Christ will bring peace over all of the earth. But for right now, he brings a personal peace to your life through prayer in a turmoil and and tough situations. So prayer brings that personal peace. Matthew 7, 7 
tells us that peace comes through answered prayer. And there Jesus was telling us in the Sermon on the Mount, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And then peace comes through heartfelt supplication to the Lord. Mark eleven twenty four. It says, I say in all things and whatever you have prayed, believe that you have received and it will be granted. So peace comes through a heartfelt supplication. And that's not to say a name it, claim it, but it is saying this, that when you're truly praying for the will of God, the presence of the Father, your prayer will be answered because God will exact his will. And then prayer comes through praying in the powerful name of Jesus. In, in John chapter 16, verse 24, this is what the scripture reads. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. But ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus was basically on his way out and he was, had his disciples around him. And he was saying, listen, up until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. But literally in a few days, you need to start praying in the name of Jesus. Who is. And so we began to, to start adopting that, and, and we pray that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. It's a psalm, many of you, depending on, you, you might hear it on Christian radio stations, and you certainly hear it in our worship choir and uh, our music ministry that sing this song, I Just Want to Speak the Name of Jesus. And here are the lyrics. I want to give it to you the first verse. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I love that. Who was ever in the presence of Jesus that did not experience peace? The woman at the well found peace. The blind, the lame, the sick, the afflicted, the outcast, the demon-possessed, they all found peace that they were looking for in Jesus. Now hold on to that for a second. I'm going to repeat that first line. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Jesus set the captives free. And sometimes we can become captives to our addictions. We can become captives to... Um, that, that dark things that some may know, some may not know. It's, our, it's hidden sins, secret sins. But we speak the name of Jesus. The lyrics go and continued like this. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. You break every stronghold. You shine through the shadows. You burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Here's the third verse. Over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus because your name is power your name is healing your name is life you break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like the fire shout Jesus from the mountaintops Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus John chapter 16, and we'll repeat it again. John chapter 16, Jesus said, Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. But now, my summary of the verse, you need to start asking for everything in my name. In the name of Jesus. 
Praying in faith brings peace that passes all understanding. Have you ever experienced that before? The peace of Christ that you don't even know? People are like, how, how are you holding up? I'm not. He's holding me up. I'm not holding up. I'm a wreck on the inside. But he's holding me up. That's the peace of Jesus. And so the peace in Jesus is the presence of Jesus. You've been in terrible situations before, either personally happening within your family and your life, or maybe you've been in situations where other people you've known and you've been trying to be with them and they've been through difficult times. And sometimes you think, man, what am I going to say? What can I say to make this better? What can I do to say or make to bring encouragement or strength or whatever? Nothing. You can't handle that burden. That's bigger than your pay grade. But you can bring Jesus there. He's the only one that can bear that burden. He's the only one that can bring that encouragement. He's the only one that can uplift in that situation. So prayer provides peace in our troubles. But also prayer provides protection and that from attacks of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, and um, I'm just going to tell you, you know, ben, <laughs> ben asked me in staff meeting, are you still going to do that? Yes, I am. At some point in time in 2024, the Lord has laid on my heart that I'm going to do a series of messages on spiritual warfare. I'm just going to lay it all out there. We're going to deal with who is our enemy. Now, our enemy likes to disguise himself and look like somebody else, but he's not really somebody else. Our enemy is the enemy, and he takes many forms, and he takes many facets, and it looks like sometimes people can get crossed or whatever, but that's, those people are not the enemy. you got to identify who the enemy really is. But in Ephesians chapter 6, as we're looking and we see that the Lord enables us to fight our enemy. And so as Paul is concluding this epistle to the believers in Ephesus, he said, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Well, that's a great exhortation. But, you know, I guess if you and I were sitting in Ephesus and we go, hey, we got a letter from Paul, let's open it up. Everybody, who wants to read it? Okay, read it aloud. And you get to finally, hey, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. That sounds great. That's a great encouragement. Rah, rah, that's a great speech. But how do I do that? So verses 11 and following, he tells us how. By put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist the devil and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all, here it is again, prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. And he continues to close. So as we see in that area, 
Prayer provides our protection. Paul reminds us that we are equipped to stand against the attacks of Satan and that we are equipped to stand against evil. God has not left us. Jesus told us, disciples, hey, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. But the Comforter is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. Hey, I'm not going to leave you defenseless and powerless. And then Paul is given the inspiration by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the rest of the story. We have the Spirit of God now in the Spirit of God. We have the weapons of God by which to fight and to have that spiritual armor that's available for the life, the constant conflicts of our lives. And so we are at war with powerful enemies. Yes, we are, but we are equipped to win. God has given us everything necessary and needed to win the battles. But prayer provides the power for overcoming spiritual foes. The victors in this battle are to pray without ceasing. And so we are to rest daily in the powerful protection that prayer provides in our lives. When we're not praying, when we're slipping, when we're sliding, when we're you know, we're, we think we're taking a gradual decline. But more times than not, we're on a very slippery slope. Because all Satan needs is a crack. You ever notice about a little mouse, how, how a little mouse can just get anywhere? You ever had a mouse in the house? It's terrible. Terrible. We lived in the church parsonage in Meridian, Mississippi. And I remember it like it was night before last. Darlene was standing in the church parsonage kitchen. And I rounded the corner and I saw that little furry friend come beneath the cabinet and stand behind her. And I just went. <laughs> and she said, what is it? And I was like, man, if I tell you what that is. <laughs> and I didn't have to. She said, it's a mouse, it's a mouse, it's a mouse. And, you know, it was on. I really thought I was going to have to explain to the church why my wife moved out for a period of time. <laughs> but I got her back in, I coached her back in, you know, no mouse, no mouse. And I found this little, much smaller hole that if I would have just, not that I did, but if I would have held the mouse and pushed it in the hole, I'd have never gotten it in there. But that mouse can just slink itself and just transform its body almost, just brittle it out its bones and can get in any little crack. Same with Satan. Any crack in your armor, he knows where it is. Every time. And when we're not close enough to the Lord, when we're not living a surrendered life to the Lord, Satan, and I'm just going to use me, and say, I got you, chip. Found where you've been neglecting. You've been neglecting your walk. You've been straying. When you're straying, when you're not praying, you're straying. And when you're not being strong, you're going to be weak. And he'll bide his time. He can wait until you're very vulnerable. That's what he does. Look at the life of Jesus. When Jesus went into the wilderness after the baptism, very high spiritual mark, Satan waited. He was not going after Jesus right then. I'll wait for 40 days and 40 nights when he hadn't drank any drop of water. I'll wait for 40 days and 40 nights when he hadn't had a morsel of food. Satan, I can wait. I'm not in a hurry. 
I'll wait till you're weak or when I think you're weak. And then I'll tell you. But Jesus was strong. And he quoted and refuted Satan would back with scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. He quoted straight out of the, straight out of the word every time. He was weaker, but he wasn't weak. So there's so much to learn and to wrap our minds around with spiritual warfare. But prayer brings protection against the enemy. And it just... It, it, by staying in the word and staying with the Lord and being close with the Lord, we experience the peace of God that surpasses all our comprehension. And it will, there's that word, guard your hearts and minds. How do you guard your mind and your heart? Through prayer. Through prayer. Through staying close with the Lord. And having that time with the Lord that, you know, you've you got to have that. You've got to be able to, to be in that frame of mind. And, you know, sometimes you're tired and, you know, it just didn't, you know, it's just your body's tired, your mind's tired, your spirit's tired. And, you know, and you may miss a day. Um, you know, that happens. Just don't miss two. If you miss two, don't miss three. Because pretty soon you start a pattern, and that pattern finds a place. Paul is writing, because I know people were probably saying, hey, Paul, man, you've been in jail for a while. And it's not, as we talked about last week, three hots and a cot and cable TV. You're in a Roman prison. And not only are you in a prison, but you are in the inner prison down in the dungeon. I hope to go there one day myself. Maritime prison, Rome, Italy. The ruins are there. How are you holding up? How are you holding up in jail? Epaphras, Timothy, all these others came to check on him. Man, how are you holding up? Man, I'm not holding up. He's holding me up. I'm not holding up. But I'm being held up by the Spirit of God in me. The Spirit of God in me is holding you up. And so he could write and talk about rejoice. And he could write in those terrible circumstances. We've got to rejoice in the Lord always, verse 4, four, 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 four. and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be made known, made known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses comprehension will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. How are you holding up, Paul? I'm not. He's holding me up. And every day in this dirty, stinky, rotten flesh place, I'm praying for God to hold me up. Let me pray that God holds you up, okay? Let's pray. Father, as believers, we can fall victim to an untruth. And that untruth is we don't need to pray. And Father, we need to pray for strength that our hearts would be guarded, our minds would be guarded from the attacks of Satan. We need to pray for the peace that passes all understanding in our situations. The Lord, God, we would not be overcome with anxiety, but rather we would have faith placed 
over those troubled times and those difficult days. To know that, Lord, you will deliver. But most importantly, you won't leave us. That your presence will be enough. As we saw in Paul's life, your presence sustained him until he gave his defense of the gospel. So, Father, hold us up, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.